Hello, my name is Aidan Rooney and I'm reading from Hingham, Massachusetts. I want to congratulate Peter and Jean on 50 years of beautiful books from the Gallery Press. Their unwavering commitment to poetry and drama from Ireland, North and South, has given us many important books, always with high editorial and production values. I love when a gallery collection arrives in the mail and it's not easy to select a poem from the poets and books read and admired over the decades. But I picked one from the early years. This is from Harry Clifton's 1982 collection, Comparative Lives. Lives. The Holding Center. Irresponsible, singing in barbed wire. Breezes lighten the silence of an emptied camp. After the trial by fire with its destitutes crowding in from the violence of the jungle trails, this pleasure, this forbidden ease, transfiguring grief into beauty, soldiers' tales into fabulous legends of the deportees. I hear the pounding of waves, the whisper of grasses, encouraging, after too many years, earth to be true to herself in pure ecstasis, beyond the blood, sweat, and tears of a human crisis. Neutral soil, her prisoners dreamt and waited in a military limbo to be lost in new paradises of the welfare states. Impersonation, this was a way to survive, exploiting a murdered connection in the grave from whence anterior lives continue to haunt them, colder generations of love and slavery in colder places. Gone to their fate, they leave the best of themselves inside those gates of the prison where they were saved, the holding center, its contradictions collapsing upon themselves like history, its tragic wards and its kitchens cut from the cane breaks, dissolving into a stateless space that frees me, somewhere between the absolute kingdoms of justice and of grace, while a bird song intervenes. I'll read a poem from my first collection, Day Release, published exactly 20 years ago in September 2000. It's got that milk chocolate cover featuring a wonderful Martin Gale landscape. The poem I'll read is called Safe Haven. Back then I thought that poems emerged from the coincidence of events. So here it's the mid-1990s and the bodies of thousands of Bosniaks have just been unearthed in the city of Srebrenica. Meanwhile, a cliff in Ireland where unchristened babies had been buried unceremoniously in the mid-1800s is being consecrated. And here in Boston, redevelopment excavations have been held up in order to reinter respectfully the unearthed remains of Irish famine victims who died en route to America or in quarantine. And if this is not enough, his nibs is putting in a driveway. Safe haven. The things you find when you drive a pick beneath the lawn's thick turf and prize it off. A rusted nest of tools, a boot's uppers, a brittle cloth, and an old fork, its tines and nape still parallel and arched. And then again, the things you're glad you don't. Earth movers turn up bones and stall the big dig in what could be Srebrenica. But there's no mother here to claim a tibia in a high top is her son's and point to a hole in the skull. Or bound the kill this fume of rain, the same that helped the sods take. But no one's here with a chrism child in a wooden box leaning into a headland wind. Here, ghosts dream they wake from quarantine sleep to this. A choice view of Boston, too late or too soon for asylum, 
but for long enough to glimpse that other boat from China or Haiti anchored off Deer Island. Wasn't it there, their ship dumped keep? And there too, a young man snatched from dream stirs in a coop. Tomorrow, we'll dig again, a new highway put underground to relieve congestion. And I'll fling gravel where the sod was, tell a neighbor what I'd found, and shape a narrative as we savor the sound, scrape, then racket of each crushed stone, sent off the shovel and finding a place to rest. One last short poem, so from Tightrope, 2007, that features a, a Michael Caine painting on the cover. This is the title poem, Tightrope. Both how when I pulled the front door this morning to let the sun in. Some night class of spinner had strung from one jamb to the other, the flimsiest funicular, that now a waft of light and air enters to live in the dusty house, passes lightning bands of silver along its barely visible floss, as if to make sure all is clear. And why is just beyond us, unless some huge jump needed to be taken. Thank you, and to the gallery press again, bravo. I'd like to congratulate Gallery Press on 50 years of extraordinary work and in particular acknowledge their kindness and loyalty to Piers Hutchinson who was a dear friend of mine and a singular and brilliant poet. I'm honoured to read two poems by Piers, one immersed in the world of Spain which he loved so deeply and the other grounded in Scotland and music and his passion against injustice and the hope of making a better world. And the first poem is The Kid on the Mountain from the 1985 collection Climbing the Light. What colours can we call them? The earth and stone that took our eyes in youth and now come back with all the pain and beauty of lost youth itself. Light brown, fawn, umber, sienna, inaccuracies, even honey, that old myth. The colour, the shades changes from stone to stone in the same building from field to foothill. Warmth, not heat, warmth built by human hands for the heat to warm and for the centuries of eyes our eyes to warm their hands at, to warm our speaking hearts at. Warmth by light out of time, a mane of colour streaming down the soft, hard back of time. When I was 27, the Malaga foothills, the light brown colour of a young goat caught on Kilmashogue, when I was 11, then skittering out of our grasp, then caught again, kept the nap, the burlap, eye feeling of clay and kid. Climbing the light, never say pale, never. Brown foothills on the opposite slope. Across the dry river, the goats were black. But kept in mind as a rough, soft, warm fawn was kept on Kilmashogue for a day. Let go, but kept in the mind until its river dries. Climbing, we heard and saw cicadas, a tremble of light in the leaves of the olive trees. And wrapping the trees' rough skin, hurting knuckles, we put the tremble out for a long minute. But then they started up again. They were the sound of heat, and the earth was the colour of warmth. Remember at 34, was that still beauty and pain? crossing the Pyrenean frontier, breaking bread together for the first time together in that beloved country, the good strong Spanish bread that needs no butter. The countryside, 
A disappointing green, but wasn't what we came for, that wasn't our need, but theirs, but theirs. The fierce red earth and the olive orchards, that was a different nettle, we grasped it with all our eyes, and how it stung us into life, and how we stung it back. But the calm, light brown, the golden stone, the myth of honey serene on golden churches, the shades changing from brick to brick, from Front Romeo to San Clement. Serene stone answering a sky that's both serene and fierce. The silent stone speaking in colour, one colour answering another, one silence speaking to the other. Hands climbing the sky through fashioned earth, bringing the earth and sky together, stone breathing time, a compact church, a tall bell tower, making a span of earth and sky, a trinity of earth and craft and sky, as holy and almost as lovely as any implacable blue. But I remember better, though stone outlast us, I can still hear a small goat herd singing in a high, thin, clear voice, half Gregorian but more blind. On the opposite hill, across a dry riverbed, his black goats meandering. He'd be in his thirties now, let's hope, let's hope. The riverbeds go dry, the fountains climb, the warm colours grow. And the second poem uh, by Pierce is from his 1975 collection, um, The Frost is All Over, also published by Gallery. Peabrook. Boarding the coffin ship for Canada, paying their pittance to the foreign owners, the clansmen found their piper lacked even that. They could not face the far sea without music. For the new land, that strange planet, they needed the music of their own lost land. So they begged the masters to let the piper play his passage. But the masters of money turned the pauper away. Money, as always, having no mercy on music, except the music of its own blind gaping wound. So the people in their need scraped around in their poverty and mustered the pittance for the music to travel. And so the masters made a little more money, but the festering hold was dancing. Lamentation swabbed the landless deck. The creaking, rotting boat was outraged and blessed. I met Michael Hartnett um, several times in the company of Pierce Hutchinson and I was very fond of him. Um, I remember a few years before Michael died, I, I met him in a crowd in Dublin and he made this very beautiful and noble gesture of kissing my hand. And I've always taken that as a, as a blessing. I'm going to read one of his late one of his last poems published in The Collected Poems. The Blink of an Eye. I see the morning star through my childhood skylight and close my eyes and dream for 50 years, reliving every setback, every highlight. I open my eyes and there's the evening star, and suddenly it's twilight. Hello, I'm Mary Heaney, and I've had a long association with the Gallery Press through my husband, Seamus Heaney. In December 1971, Peter Fallon, a student then, but someone who had already established the Gallery Press, came to our house in Belfast with 50 broadsides of a poem by Seamus Chaplet that he wanted Seamus to sign. 
So that was our first introduction to Gallery Press. Over the next 49 years, Gallery Press has published a number of special editions of Seamus' work. They have also published the Christmas cards that we sent every year for many years. A poem, Seamus chose a poem and Gallery Press printed it and it was sent to friends and uh, relatives and I treasure them very much. I'm going to read two poems uh, of Seamus's and then one by another poet, another poet who is also published by Gallery Press, Elaine Nequilnoy. The first poem I'm going to read is Elegy, and it's about the great American poet Robert Lowell, whom Seamus admired very much indeed. Robert Lowell came to visit us twice when we were in Ireland. The first time we were living in a cottage in County Wicklow, and the second time he came to us in our house in Dublin. Five days before his sudden death. And the poem is an elegy for him. The, our house in Dublin overlooked the Irish Sea and that is echoed and mentioned. The whole maritime thing is mentioned throughout the poem. Elegy. The way we are living, timorous or bold, will have been our life. Robert Lowell, the sill geranium is lit by the lamp I write by. A wind from the Irish sea is shaking it. Here, where we all sat ten days ago with you, the master elegist and welder of English. As you swayed the talk and rolled in the swaying tiller of yourself, ribbing me about my fear of water, what was not within your empery? You drank America like the heart's iron vodka, promulgating art's deliberate, peremptory love and arrogance. Your eyes saw what your hand did as you Englished Russian, as you bullied art, heart-hammering blank sonnets of love for Harriet and Lizzie and the briny, water-breaking dolphin, your dorsal nib gifted at last to inveigle and to clash, helmsman, netsman, retiarius. That hand, warding and grooming and amphibious. 2 a.m., seaboard weather, not the proud sail of your great verse, no. You are our night ferry, thudding in a big sea, the whole craft ringing with an armourer's music the course set willfully across the ungovernable and dangerous. And now a team of rain and the geranium trees. A father's no shield for his child. You found the child in me when you took farewells under the full bay tree by the gate in Glanmore, opulent and restorative as that lingering summertime, the fish dart of your eyes, risking, I'll pray for you. The second poem I'm going to read is called Terminus and it is published in a gallery press book called Hailstones. It was published in 1984 and it's about living between two eras really, between the old and the new. Terminus. When I hoped there I would find an acorn and a rusted bolt. If I lifted my eyes a factory chimney and a dormant mountain. If I listened, an engine shunting and a trotting horse. Is it any wonder when I thought I would have second thoughts? When they spoke of the prudent squirrel's hoard, it shone like gifts at a nativity. When they spoke of the mammon of iniquity, the coins in my pockets reddened like stove lids. Two buckets were easier carried than one. I grew up in between. My left hand placed the standard iron weight. My right tilted a last grain in the balance. Baronies, parishes met where I was born. When I stood on the central stepping stone, I was the last earl on horseback in midstream, still parleying in earshot 
of his curves. I'm now going to read the poem by Eleni Quinlan called That Summer. It is an elegiac poem as well. So what did she do that summer when they were all out working? If she moved, she felt a soft rattle that settled like a personal of small change. She staggered through the quiet of the house, leaned on a flowering doorpost and went back inside from the glare, feeling in her skirt pocket the skin on her hands never so smooth since her 14th year. One warm evening they were late. She walked across the yard with a can, watered a geranium and kept on going till she came to the ridge looking over the valley at the low stacked hills, the steep ground between that plunged like a funnel of sand. She couldn't face back home. They came for her as she stood watching the hills breathing out and in their dialogue of hither and yon. I want to give my sincerest congratulations to Peter and Jean and everyone else who has worked for the last 50 years at Gallery Press to make it a most important part of Irish literary life.